Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Gavin. Now, you and I are brothers of Reveal already. We had bo both of us have films on here, uh, and it took meeting in person at the Beloit International Film Festival just a week or so ago uh, to actually connect and realize, like, hey, wait, we know where we know each other's names from. Yep. Uh, your film, Farewell to Darkness, uh, which is also screening at the festival, um, is, is, is on Reveal and available for everyone to watch. It's a feature film, so go ahead and tell folks in your own words, so I don't screw it up, what the film is about. Well, Feral Darkness is about a young man who uh, is abused as a child and then uh, gets himself into some legal trouble uh, when he's a, a late teenager and decides mm -hmm. to join the Marines to go ahead and try and get his life together and winds up serving in Iraq. And while he's overseas, he finds out that his mother uh, has been continually abused by his father. Um, and has finally decided to end her own life and commit suicide. And he comes home to Chicago to get revenge. So it's a rom-com. It is. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a feel-good movie of the week. We're, we're good. It's, it's, it's very dark, uh, addressing a lot of uh, you know, mental health issues, which, which I feel has become very prominent in filmmaking in the last 10 years or so. I, I feel like, but also as a society, we're unlocking uh mental health issues as, as we're just as a society starting to understand ptsd a bit more mm -hmm. um you were a bit ahead of the curve i feel on this because this this movie was shot some time ago mm -hmm. are these themes that you find yourself exploring in your work often or is this standalone from uh your other works well um yeah we shot the film in 2007 mm -hmm. and it was written as early as 2005 um and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a theme that I continually address within my own work. Um, you know, isolation, uh, mental illness, they've always sort of played a role in my, in my films, uh, particularly also the military um, and trauma. Um, you know, people dealing with trauma seems to be a continual theme uh, that I, you know, explore in life. Um, I'm no stranger to therapy, so I guess it's, it's just an extension of me. <laughs> I feel like uh, most filmmakers should be in therapy, but use the excuse of being an artist like myself to not go to therapy. Uh, is is there is there a hope that there's a message in your film that will connect with an audience out there when you're dealing with these subjects? I think what I would love to have an audience take away from, I mean, I guess I could speak mainly for Farewell Darkness, is that healing is possible, you know, despite how far down the whole like just as an example our main character michael you know he's so far down the hole of rage and anger that it seems improbable that he will overcome that and he's going to carry out his his mission mm -hmm. and um you know but it, the the idea of the movie is that it is not too late you still have a choice you always have a choice in life and you know, it, you know, and, and life changes at, you know, the spur of the moment, you know, every second to second can be a, a, a gigantic change. Um, sorry, my apologies. No um, worries. Can be a we all live in a Zoom world now where, where yeah, anything, is, anything is possible. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought I turned everything off. It's but, shocking uh, to me out of all the episodes revealed that I've done. My dog is not interrupted one because he tends to the minute I try to get on any Zoom call or phone call, he's squeaking in the background or wants picked up. So, you know, you're, <laughs> inevitably I'll be the one interrupting interviews. I know it. It's all good. Um, so, but yeah, the, so you always have a choice in life. You're never far too mm -hmm. far down the hole to, to stop and choose a different path. And that's what I would hope that uh, an audience takes away from Feral Darkness, definitely. So this is definitively earlier in your, in your film career, just by the nature of time. What, what was the biggest challenge of making this film and what is the sort of number one lesson you learned off of this project that you've, you've been able to carry forward and either not repeat the mistake or know that this is, you know, a, a, a thing that I must do on each film from here on in. Um, I would say my, the biggest challenge uh, to, to the film was uh, just the scale of it. You know, it's a movie that took place in Chicago, Texas, Iraq, um, 
you know, we had, you know, uh, at least 30 or 40 locations mm-hmm. all, all, all said and done. And we had to shoot the movie. The movie was shot in, in about 28 days over the course of six months. Um, and, uh, or, uh, yeah, it was about, about five, six months. And, um, it was just an enormous undertaking for a $36,000 movie. Um, and we had to fake a great deal of it, but knowing what I wanted going in was, I think the big saving grace. I had a really clear vision of the film I was making. I knew if I was going to walk into a scene, what shots and what angles I would need before I go, I showed up. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how we kind of, we got through um, just the, the scale of it. Now in terms of um, what was your second question? Oh, the, what, what you learned from this uh, that you oh. can carry forward for every shoot since then, that there was like the, the golden thing you learned off of this film. Oh, that definitely the same thing that got me through the film Um Well, there were two big lessons I learned from the movie. The the first one was, excuse me, um, was that having a clear vision is the savior Mm -hmm. for any production. If you go in not knowing what you want, uh, you're you're gonna cut you know waste time and waste money, and you may or may not walk out with a story. Um, For me, uh, having all the preparation that I did on the movie. and uh, being intimately involved in every decision with the film, because I was prepping most of it by myself. Mm-hmm. So as I was producing the film, producing the movie, I was the location scout. I would go to locations. I took the location photos. I made the final decisions on, you know, every wardrobe piece because I didn't have a wardrobe person. Yeah. I didn't have a location manager. Um, you know, so those things were that was helpful. Um, and then I think the second thing that I learned about the movie was. Uh, was a mistake I made, um, and I've tried not to repeat it since, which is um, the strongest choice you can make in a movie while you're shooting your movie can not always be, will not always be the right choice. Okay. And, you know, as I was making the film, you know, I was young and I wanted to, I was 27 when I made the movie, and I, you know, it was my first full feature film, and I wanted to make a movie that was going to really affect the audience and really have something that was going to be different, you know, and and be really strong. Um, and I made strong choices, quote unquote. But uh, they, you know, sometimes maybe went too far. You know, the movie has scenes of child abuse in it. And I think I, if I'd handled those scenes uh, with more sensitivity, I think I would have made a, uh, I think a film that would have been a little more digestible to more audience members, but it still plays well and it still plays strong. It's just, I was like, okay, maybe we don't need to take things as far and the audience will get the same idea. The some audience. of that, some of that might come with age too. Cause I think when we're all younger and brash, we're like, you know, and, and, and part of my own filmmaking approach is to be very in, in, in your face. Like if, if this is the scene that we're depicting, I want to sometimes make the audience uncomfortable enough so that they can experience what's happened without being gratuitous. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of uh, uh, over sexuality or, or violence in a movie, but for those odd moments where it's uh, important for me to make somebody uncomfortable, I feel like there, there is the right time. Like, and I, I guess maybe that's just my own prerogative because when I watched the movie, none of that stood out to me as being too, too much. Uh, but I think, you know, as, as age softens most of us, you know, we, sure. we, we lose a bit of our edge. And I think re- reflection is uh, also watching so many other movies handle things more sensitively, I think sometimes like affects you. But I, I, I wouldn't say that there's anything in this film that is uh, going too far. And definitely the, the subject matter, I feel, is handled well. Like if you can push it uh, in a tough direction if you're still handling it with care versus uh, just doing it to be gratuitous. Sure. I, I know. I, and that was something I was always worried about too. Like I never wanted to be gratuitous when mm-hmm. I was making the film. Um, you know, we tried to handle things with care. There were things that were more, I mean, there was more, I don't want to say the word explicit, but there was more intense footage that I cut out of the movie. Yeah. There was a scene that we removed where our main character, when he was a child, kills a dog. And we, we looked at it and I had it in there all the way till I started previewing the movie. And then I showed it to one preview audience and I had a person say, wait, did he just kill that dog? 
And then we were like, what would he, I was like, was that not, uncle, was that not clear? And she's like, no, cause if he killed that dog, I don't want to watch anymore. I said, no, he did. If he didn't kill that dog, we'll cut the scene. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, there's, there's certain things that will just automatically upset audiences. Yeah. Uh, don't watch Marley and me. If you don't like uh, dog death, uh, spoiler <laughs> alert. I, I, I think it's interesting. Do you ever find yourself, you know, you, you've, you know, cause I've, I've come up the same path too, where the movies I was making around the same time, uh, you know, um, director, producer, editor, sometimes cinematographer, uh, location scout, wardrobe, hair, makeup, like whatever it takes to get the job done. Do you ever find yourself now like looking at a project or reading a script and being like, uh, we can't do this. It's, it's, it's too much. And then you have to remind yourself, no, no, wait, when I had no money, no resources and, and le arguably less talent and skill, I was already doing it. I find myself like talking myself out of things now where I have to remind myself like, no, it's all entirely possible. It just takes a big deep breath and to find that that courage that I had when I was younger. Oh, absolutely. I, I recently had written a film. Uh, it was going to be a short uh, and uh, I had given it to the investors. And like in my mind, I, you know, ignorance is bliss, not knowing what the cost was going to be on something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, not in the sense of like not knowing what things cost, but like, you know, I, I was already considering, okay, so how am I going to build the sets? You know, we've got a spaceship set, so I got to build that. I'm like, okay, that'll take me X amount of time. I see this space and like, I just got to make sure I have a, a saw. I got to, you know, rent a truck for lumber. And like, I'm already doing the production design stuff in my head. And then I actually sat and I thought about it and I was just like, I'm like, you know, you can you can hire people to do some of this. <laughs> you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, and I, I was like, as I've gotten older, I think it's for me, it's a little bit of like I'm always willing to do it all myself. But then I have to stop myself and say, you're not physically capable of doing bigger and bigger things by yourself. You need help. And collaboration that's, collaboration yeah. right that's that's <laughs> what that's where we're supposed to move to yeah so farewell darkness how do you go about finding your cast on, on sort of your earlier you know because i imagine most of us didn't have access to a casting director or sort of you know union cast or name cast you're making this small indie film outside of the la you know new york film system how do you go about casting um well i i did have a a, a local uh, actor who wanted to be a casting director. Okay. So he was, he was giving me his time in exchange for, I mean, I paid him a very small amount of money. I think it was yeah. a few hundred dollars and, uh, he did the whole film. Um, but there were also, um, you know, the acting pool I'd been paying attention to who was who for, you know, over a decade at that point, you know, uh, you know, since I was started film school, mm -hmm. I'd been looking at, you know, every short film, I would be like, Oh, that guy's really good. Like, Roy Anderson, who um, uh, played Uncle Lee in the movie, I saw him in a student film that uh, one of my classmates had done, and I, I thought he was he was great in that short film. And I said, you know, I have to remember Roy if I ever do anything. Same with Circus Shalevsky, who played uh, Roman. Um, you know, I had seen him in in short films, and some friends of mine had worked with him, and they all said really great things about him. So when he came into audition, um, I immediately recognized him as like, oh. He's somebody I need to, I need to consider. Keith was um, the who played the lead. Uh, he was um, a friend of a friend, and I met him when I was editing a short film that he had acted in. And he came into the editing room to do some ADR lines for us, mm -hmm. and we got along right away. But you know, I, I hadn't even considered him because he was really skinny back then. And uh, when he showed up to audition, I immediately recognized him. But I was like, you know. I'm like, Keith, you know, you, you've put on, you know, like 20 pounds of, of muscle at that point. Yeah. He was a trainer at Crunch. <laughs> so I was like, well, you look more like a Marine now. Um, and just, you know, that point he was physically in the right shape. And um, he was actually not even my first choice. I, I tried to cast a lot of the film on my own um, and did a terrible job because I was taking offers to people without really vetting them and, making a lot of mistakes yeah. um, and thankfully i i did not go that route so you have all these locations you know typically we're taught you know not that there's a correct way to do anything but you're taught to okay you got a limited budget you're making your first film write a movie with two or three actors that takes place in one location you <laughs> obviously didn't get that lesson no. 
what was the hardest location to secure out of everything that you had? Oh, the, 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 the Iraq location. Um, that's, that was a whole, um, debacle. Um, basically when we were, we, when we shot in Chicago, things went relatively smooth because, um, the majority of the production was done there. And at that time in 2007, people were relatively open to almost nearly anything within reason. Um, you know, and we were a small show. We had no more than 12 or 13 people on set and, you know, you know, with the, you know, plus actors, most of the film, I had no big crew. I had a cameraman, a, a sound guy, me, and maybe a couple of people to help. And that was it. Um, we had no makeup department, nothing. Um, and when we went to Arizona to go shoot the Iraq footage, that's when things changed. That was going to be a much bigger, mm -hmm. um, uh, shoot um you know that was when we were going to have a makeup department and uh camera department and just the, the whole sheboygan and uh we showed up and all the things that we were told by the phoenix film commission turned out to be untrue oh and boy we had driven like i had a really dedicated group of, of filmmakers who wanted to, to do this so we we drove from chicago to arizona overnight wow and showed up. It was me, uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was our uh, script supervisor, uh, Keith, the lead actor, our sound person, and uh, Jason Deichler, our cinematographer. And we had all of our gear in the, the van, and we literally borrowed my parents' van and drove overnight. We showed up in Arizona. We were supposed to have about four or five days of pre-production. Then we were going to shoot for two days and then mm -hmm. drive right home. And when we showed up, we went right to a meeting with the Phoenix Film Commission and they suddenly it was like oh well you know you guys are going to have vehicles out there we're like yeah that was always part of the deal because we we're supposed to the scenes were all supposed to be different they were all written to be different yeah. things and um you know the, like we had a half track which was going to be like a personnel character and all this carrier and all this stuff and they were like oh you can't have that out there without a you know um uh without a fire truck and you need to have a fire truck. You need to have this municipality needs to get paid. And it was basically, it was like, it felt like a shakedown. Yeah. It went from, it's going to be this price. And then it went three times higher. And next thing you know, they were asking me for like $25,000 just for the municipalities to shoot there. And I was like, we don't, you know, I've got $8,000 for this. Is that, is that when you investment. learned about, is that when you learned about green screen and just shot it in your garage instead? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, at that time with, with the, that, we, that wouldn't even been an option, but um, I know that there were certain producers calling me and saying, maybe you should do something like that. Um, but uh, so we were down there and I started talking to David, my producer who met us there. And he was like, well, you know, there's these, there's this, um, you know, we started looking at uh, other areas around uh, Phoenix, and then we intercepted an email that was not supposed to be sent to us uh, from the Phoenix Film Commission saying that we were sketchy and we shouldn't be dealt with. And, you know, basically all the, the surrounding counties broke off communication with us. So wow. we, we got just screwed by the phoenix film commission i will i mean the only reason i even say that is because i, I doubt any of those people are still there um and because uh, this was 15 years ago yeah um but uh so we were like well we're 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 fucked what do we do i'm sorry am i allowed to swear i don't know uh, uh fuck if i know yeah, I guess. yeah so we're, we're like fine. we're fucked yeah. <laughs> um you know should should we just drive home and try and get some money back from the hotel and, you know, there was one last option, which was CGS Studios in Avondale had a um, Mediterranean village as their back lot. And we we went down there with a guy who was going to do the, the limited production design mm -hmm. we, were, we were planning. And we asked him if he could turn that if he had the, the materials to turn that into like a market in, you know, Baghdad. Yeah. And we started at that point we started having negotiations with the um the studio and they you know they came back to us and they wanted four thousand dollars more than we had so i had then two days to basically beg borrow and steal the wow. additional money to film so that that sequence those two days cost us twelve thousand dollars 
Now it's a modern reference, but I always think it's it's that scene in the Avengers when in Endgame when they're about to go back in time and they're all putting their hand, fists on each other. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, <laughs> uh, and that that's independent film. Like you, once your train leaves the station on an indie film, you have to keep going at all costs, and you have to solve the problems by rewriting it, changing scenes, recasting. Like, but you cannot let the momentum because if that train stops or stalls, even often you can't get it back on the tracks because it's too hard to come back and get everybody and everything back together. And you know what? Every time and this, this, this podcast is also a part therapeutic for me because every time I think I've heard of every scenario gone wrong for filmmakers or experienced it myself, a filmmaker like yourself comes on here and shares a story like that, which is completely new and completely the email going out saying that you're all untrustworthy and somebody trying to just like like cripple your success yeah. with surrounding areas because they they had wronged you unimaginable and 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 also just crazy that you were even privy to that email and, and understood what was happening so you didn't keep spinning your wheels but we like to keep these things short we're already kind of over time but as i learned in uh in beloit you and i could talk for hours and hours and i'm yeah. sure we will off camera but daniel thank you for joining us today anybody out there reveal is a hundred percent free you sign up for an account like you would any other streaming service. You'll never see an ad. You don't have to pay for it month to month. They don't want your credit card information. And you can watch great films like Farewell Darkness that Daniel here directed and wrote and did the, I think, the hair, makeup, catering, and um, <laughs> you know, pro probably are at least seven voices in the ADR background as well. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, I hope uh, you out there get to check out my movie. It's listen, it's a great reason to sign up for reveal. It's free. You get to watch a bunch of independent films. If you're an independent filmmaker or an actor working in the independent scene, this is a great place to check out all of your peers and find some amazing collaborators for down the road. Daniel, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Gavin.